Hi, this is Michelle Mutapa from Cal State Fullerton, and my co-presenter for this presentation is Lena Njoku, my counterpart at Cal State Long Beach. And this presentation is called Goodies from the NAAHP SAC, Optimizing Use of AAMC Advisor-Only Information to Dispel the State School Stereotype. Um, so on this presentation, Lena and I will be tag teaming with each other, um, sharing you the information that goes with this presentation. Um, by way of background, Lena and I decided to collaborate for this presentation because we belong to sister campuses in the CSU system, which has 23 campuses, serves nearly a million students, and our campuses are pretty close to each other in terms of proximity. We have very similar demographics in our student populations, and so we wanted to use advisor information that's readily available at our fingertips to be able to compare our schools and see um, what similarities our students have with each other's um, on acceptance rates into medical school. Um, so let's begin. On the agenda for today, uh, we will start by introducing uh, the topic that we will outline, go over the objectives of the presentation, um, the practical value of this presentation, talk a little bit about the methods, results, and the patterns found, as well as some considerations moving forward after the discussion. CSULB and CSU Fullerton are both Hispanic-serving large public institutions serving 30,000 students more than 30,000 students. As, an advisor, as advisors at these large institutions, we are often presented with questions from students and parents about a graduate's competitiveness to medical schools based on name alone. Just a little bit of information about our um, institutions. Uh, we are, like I mentioned, we are a large public teaching institution, um, and we are home to academic and talented and motivated students who bring diversity to the health profession. However, when you look at aggregate data on the acceptance rates, it may uh, seem like a little bit of a different story. Upon examining the um, AAMC data at our respective institutions, um, it seems as though with, on face value that our acceptance rates are a bit lower than um, the national data and our UC uh, school counterparts. However, the good news is that um, with analysis, uh, the students who were accepted into medical school had similar academic metrics, uh, GPA and MCAT score, compared to national averages. Uh, simply put, the data seems to suggest that admissions decisions are based more strongly upon academic merit as opposed to uh, the university that they attended. So the objectives of this study is to show how you can use Advisor Information System, or AIS, data to understand the academic metrics of competitive undergraduate students on your campus. Well, in our case, for Lena and I, it would be uh, California State University applicants based upon findings from our respective campuses. So you could basically do the same. The data is re um, readily available for you on the AAMC AIS website. We'll show you how to use it. Um, and with this data, what we're doing is exploring the myth of students being disadvantaged by the undergraduate institution they attend. Um, so, for example, if the data showed that our students who got into medical school on average had a 3.9 GPA compared to the national average of students who got accepted, let's say they're somewhere around 3.7, then we would say our students are disadvantaged because it seems as if coming from Cal State, uh, university system, they have to have a higher GPA in order to get in. That's what, that would be an example of a disadvantage. So we're exploring that using the data that's re readily available for us. And with this data, we also want to use, use it to identify successful advising approaches, which we will share with you. The value of this presentation is that advisors will learn how to access academic metrics and acceptance information on all individual students from their campuses. This, this information can be used to track the outcomes of individual students who came in for advising. Um, and let's say you also had students who belonged to particular programs that you were running. 
um, you could use that data to see if your program was as effective or had certain outcomes that you were hoping for. Um, you can also learn how many students apply to medical school in a given campus during a given application cycle. So there could be, maybe you do know all the students who ended up applying to medical school on your campus, but then for some of the larger campuses, like in the CSU system, um, you may not end up seeing everybody because some students end up doing it on their own. Um, you can also aggregate the outcomes to discover the average academic metrics of students who are accepted into one or more medical schools. So that's what Lena and I did with our data. So we're gonna share that with you. So while I mentioned that the AIS data is readily available for you, it is kind of a maze to actually find it. Um, there's many steps you have to go through. So I wanted to show it to you here because I know for me personally, sometimes I need the step-by-step -step directions to be able to figure it out. Um, so what you first have to do, number one, is log on to the NAAHP website, um, which can be found on NAAHP.org. Um, from there, you select the Professional Resources tab. From there, you select the NAAHP SAC, which has all sorts of good resources for advisors. From there, you scroll down and click on Allopathic Medicine. Um, it's under the Professions and Professional Resources tab. From there, you scroll down and click on Advisor-only information. Advisor only information. It's under Highlighted Links and Resources. From there, number six, you click on the AAMC Advisor Hub. From there, number seven, you click on the Advisor Information System. Number eight, you click on, you sign into the AAMC website. So for that, you would have a username and password. And then you simply have to, number nine, agree with the AIS terms of use to be able to access it. Once you're in, you can click on Roster of Applicants, number 10. And here you select students you want to retrieve data for. Um, so you can, for example, pick certain application cycle years. Um, you can filter by degree status. Um, in the case for Lena and I, we pick students who were undergraduate students at our respective campuses and what their um, admissions information looked like in terms of getting accepted into medical school. Um, once you do that, you select Submit. Once you go through all that information, this is the output that you get. You get each applicant's name, um, their AAMC ID number, um, their biology, chemistry, physics, and math GPA, their academic other GPA, their cumulative GPA, their most recent MCAT score, um, their AMCAS status, whether or not their application was processed or not processed, and lastly, the number of medical schools that a given student got into. So if they didn't get accepted into any medical schools, that number would be zero. On this slide, we have presented um, ASI data um, over a three-year time frame from 2017 to 2019, showing the acceptance rates and application rates of CSU Fullerton and CSU Long Beach students um, and also presented the national data just for 2019. We included a total of three years just because uh, the number of students actually applying are pretty low so we wanted to um, get a better grasp over a three-year uh, time frame. So at face value, when you look at the data, uh, it does support the myth that CSU students are less likely to receive MD acceptances. Um, however, uh, with a closer look at the numbers, um, you can see that CSU students are actually uh, more likely to apply with lower test scores and lower GPAs. But when you look at the acceptance rates of those that are applying with uh, closer to the national average numbers, then our acceptance rate um, is closer to the actual national acceptance rates. So year after year, we see that the majority of the students applying from state schools 
typically are below the national average GPA and MCAT score. Um, from the advisor's standpoint, it has been observed that students are more likely to apply with lower scores when they are not working with a pre-health advisor or uh, don't have um, assistance in the application process. In addition, students attending state schools are more likely to be first generation and from underserved areas. These groups of students are also less likely to seek out resources and assistance when applying to graduate programs. Uh, they are also less likely to seek out test preparations for the MCAT, often resulting in taking the test multiple times without much improvement. So just a, a quick summary, it's, it's sort of a good news, bad news sort of scenario for our students at, in the California State University system. Um, what we see is that if our students have competitive MCAT scores and competitive GPAs, they get into um, medical school just like if as if they went to any other campus. The bad news part of it is a lot of our students who get around to applying in the first place don't have those metrics to be competitive, hence our lower acceptance rates. So what might, you know, why is this the case? And so Lena and I discussed and, and we came up with some major areas that we think are issues that cause this. One is academic preparation. Many students come from schools where opportunities for enhanced academic training were limited. Hence, their transition to the university was more challenging, hence lower GPAs in their freshman, sophomore years. Um, financial resources, number two. Many students have limited financial resources to pay for MCAT preparation materials and courses. Often students just rely on books. They don't have the resources to get a class. Um, and especially if they if they didn't have a strong start to begin with, they don't have a solid foundation in some of the classes, they probably could benefit from increased studying materials for the MCAT, which they just don't afford, they cannot afford. Um, first generation students, many of our students are first generation students, and they initially struggle, struggle oftentimes in seeking support on campus and identifying their career goals. We've seen this quite a bit among our students. Um, and then for both of us, a lot of our students are commuter students. And so what does this mean? It means that the majority of students on our campuses um, are less likely to utilize campus resources to best prepare themselves for postgraduate work. Um, for example, we have awesome student organizations that are great at helping students understand what's needed to get into professional schools. But if they're commuter students, they may not have the time to go to these meetings or just don't find the time to go to these meetings. Um, hence, these are missed opportunities for professional development. Through our work with students, what we have found is uh, the students that take advantage of the following tend to have more likelihood of getting acceptance. Now, these uh, potential solutions may be applicable to all students, but our students at the Cal State level, when we see that they take advantage of these things, um, it maximizes their um, likelihood of acceptance. So those things include academic preparation, um, early advising to help students select an academic plan that maximizes their chances of earning a competitive GPA, um, encouraging students to use low-cost MCAT test prep materials prior to investing in more expensive programs, advocating for scholarships that cover MCAT test prep and application costs. Um, for first-generation students, I think um, that intrusive advising is especially important, just uh, following up with them, emailing them. Um, if they don't reply right away, just um, making sure to continue to reach out um, to them in various avenues, just to make sure at each step of the application process that they are being supported. Um, and then the commuter campus. So increasing options for remote student engagement, so alternatives to in-person advising, uh, phone appointments, um, uh, being able to assist students thoroughly over email, etc. cetera. Uh, these are all um, solutions, again, that can be uh, broadly applied. However, um, our students that are uh, from disadvantaged, first generation, um, underserved communities uh, need these solutions 
in order to maximize their acceptances. So after carefully considering our findings, Lena and I were talking about it and, and just looking at the patterns of our data. Um, so we're wondering, when does holistic review begin among admissions committees? Um, so by and large, the students who were accepted that we saw um, had competitive GPAs and MCAT scores. I mean, there was an occasional exception where a student with a substantially lower GPA got in, um, but for the most part, the holistic review aspect comes seems to go into effect um, only when competitive metrics are obtained. And then secondly, how is data presented at other institutions? Um, so, for example, some schools would say something like they have a 90% acceptance rate. Um, Alina was talking about one particular school um, where they tout a 90% acceptance rate. And, and how accurate is that? How do they filter the data to actually get um, that kind of result. Is it accurate? Is it comparable to, for example, your data? So just because your data doesn't look like the data of another campus doesn't mean um, that your acceptance rates aren't as strong. It could be that they're just filtering their data in a different way than you are. So in conclusion, we say that the utilization of AAMC data, which is available at your finger fingertips, can help you learn more about your individual students and trends across your students over the years. A careful examination of these trends can help you identify what you, as an advisor, can do to promote pre-health student success. In our case, we found that our students often apply with lower academic metrics than what would be competitive. And so what can we do about that? And that's what we discussed in this presentation. Um, you can also collect other types of data on students that you advise. For example, the number of clinical hours they have, the research experience they have, the kinds of leadership experiences they have, and so forth, to further understand how these factors are related to students' acceptance into medical school. Um, so that's all we have for you today. Thank you so much for listening to us.